Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our second session of our Controversies and Collaboration, Moving Towards Consensus in Animal Welfare, Indo-Pacific Asia Online Workshop in 2022. My name is Mia Cobb. I'm from the University of Melbourne, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this second session, which will be focusing on training and animal welfare. We've got a great diversity of talks. We've got three wonderful speakers who will be, uh, will be playing their recordings and then we'll be having them join us live uh, for the question and answer session. If this is the first session you've joined us for, please know that you can find the full program and abstract booklet at the U4 website, which will pop into the chat box shortly. And you can put any questions into the question section of the control panel. Um, and we'll be putting those to the speakers when we come to our joint question and answer session at the end, which will run for 15 minutes. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is Esther Mastre from the Ocean Park, Hong Kong. And Esther will be speaking about short and long-term impact of cognitive enrichments on dolphin welfare. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Ray. We are the research, research department of Ocean Park Hong Kong. Our department aims to build a strong link between the four main pillars of contemporary animal management. Scientific advancement. Animal welfare. Conservation. And education. In this study, we aim to find out the long and the short term impact of the use of cognitive enrichment devices with dolphins under human care. The study was conducted in the Ocean Theatre, one of the two facilities of Ocean Park Hong Kong. The study involved six male bottlenose dolphins and it was conducted over a three-year period. But what are environmental enrichment devices? or EEDs for short. EEDs are a routine part of modern collection management. They provide opportunities for both mental and physical stimulation. They carry multiple enrichment components that target different sensory modalities and can be categorized by their function, such as visual enrichment, auditory enrichment, olfactory enrichment, which doesn't exist for dolphins, tactile, structural enrichment, social enrichment, or feeding enrichment. A special subset of environmental enrichment are cognitive enrichment that represent challenges of an animal's natural habitat and engage their innate problem-solving skills. The effectiveness of cognitive enrichment has been demonstrated in both farm as well as zoological settings. Dr. Clark in 2013 proposed a framework for marine mammals that emphasized three aspects of adequate cognitive enrichment, control over their environment, submerged problem solving, and submerged spatial problem solving tasks. In the wild, dolphins collaborate together for multiple purposes, such as hunting together, finding mates, or looking after the young ones. Following the original design of Dr. Sen Kutsai and his team, a cooperative enrichment device was designed and used. The device consisted of a PVC tube and two caps attached with a rope handle. The device was filled with fish and ice, temporary seal, and presented to the dolphins. Each session lasted for 15 minutes and the dolphins' actions were captured both underwater and above water. The videos were analyzed post session using Boris behavioral coding software. The analysis focused on two behaviors, cooperative opening and cooperative play with the device. The fish and ice were shared between the dolphins and once the device was emptied, the dolphins usually engaged in cooperative play. <laughs> 
During cooperative play, the dolphins were observed to engage in synchronous swim while holding the device. They kept the same speed, depth, and rhythm of surfacing. The cooperative enrichment device was tested with multiple dolphin groups, with the findings published in scientific papers. The second cognitive enrichment device that we tested was focusing on a special type of cooperation, looking at altruistic actions in dolphins. Here, one dolphin could open the device but not retrieve the fish, while the other dolphins could take the fish from the device. What we were interested in, how did these cognitive enrichment devices improve or impact dolphin welfare? So we observed the dolphin group, the same dolphin group, six dolphins, for a three-year period that included 202 days when we were having a research session and 808 days when there were no research sessions conducted. Research sessions were conducted twice weekly and the behavior of the animals were monitored through questionnaires that were filled out by the trainer's team. The trainers were observing the animals during the free swimming time in three time slots during the morning and three time slots during the afternoon. During this observation period, seven welfare indicators were observed and noted by presence absence for each dolphin for both morning and afternoon separately. The care team or the trainers who participated in this research had to have at least minimum of six months experience and they were filling out the questionnaire together with the daily logs. This allowed a very simple and long-term procedure, meaning that filling out the questionnaire could be implemented in the daily work and the daily operation of the care team without any uh, serious challenges. The seven welfare indicators included five positive and two potentially negative welfare indicators. The first positive indicator would play with water. The dolphins open his mouth, takes a considerable amount of water and presses it through its teeth, or playing with water like fountains as sprays over the body. Um, the second one was play with enrichment. Uh, the dolphins was interacting such as transporting, dribbling, catching or throwing uh, with the enrichment devices. These were not the cognitive enrichment devices. So I have to emphasize that these observations were made outside of the research session when the animals had access to their regular enrichment devices. The third positive um, indicator was the affiliative tactile behavior, such as touch, rub, nozzle, another individual with beak, flipper, or other body parts. Another positive indicator was social play, where two or more individuals interacted with the same enrichment um, simultaneously. And the last one was synchronous swim, where two or more individuals swam together, keeping the same speed and depth. The two potentially negative welfare indicators were aggression and potential stereotypy. Aggression included chasing, slapping, or biting another individual. Uh, we haven't really had any serious aggressive behavior, such as deep rake marks and so on. So here I included the table that was taken from Seawell, uh, Dr. Clegg's work in 2015, when the rake marks are scored basically 0, uh, 1, and 2. Our animals never really had any of the serious ones. Um, potential stereotypic behaviors were considered behaviors that were repetitive, invariant behavior patterns, such as um, circular swim or potential regurgitations. I keep emphasizing potential stereotypy because all these behaviors have a sort of function that is debated whether it's stereotypical or not. Um, so we did record these behaviors, however, we have to be a little bit cautious when we consider them stereotypic uh, or categorize them as stereotypy. Five of the seven welfare indicators showed significant differences between session and non-session days. Play with enrichment, affiliative tactile, social play, and synchronous swim were observed more frequently on session days than on non-session days. In turn, 
the frequency of aggression was significantly lower on session days compared to non-session days. When we looked at the long-term impact of the use of the cognitive enrichment devices, we saw an overall increase of the positive welfare indicators during both session days and non-session day conditions over the 36 months of observation period. While there was no significant difference in water play between session day and non-session day conditions, on this graph it can be seen very clearly that over the 36 months period there was a long-term increase in water play in during both session day and non-session days. Enrichment play was always very frequent, but there is still an overall long-term increase over the 36 months period for both session days and non-session days. Affiliatic tactile behaviors were always higher on session days than on non-session days, but there was also an overall increase over the 36 months period. Social play also showed a long-term increase over the 36 months. As this video, you can see how the dolphins are passing the ball between themselves, which is a very beautiful example of social play between the dolphins. Synchronous rhythm was significantly higher on session days than on non-session days, and also increased over the 36 month period for both session days and non-session day conditions. While there was no significant difference between session days and non-session days conditions for potential stereotypical behaviors, there was still an overall long-term decrease over the 36 months period for both conditions. Aggression was the least frequently observed behavior out of the seven indicators, but there was still a significant decrease during session days compared to non-session days conditions, and there was an overall long-term decrease over the 36 months. Moreover, the social network analysis of aggressive interactions between the group member also supported an overall decrease of aggression during session days. After the successful use of the two-way devices, we developed other cognitive enrichment devices, still focusing on cooperation that allowed multiplayer interactions between our dolphins. The devices were made of PVC pipes, fittings and caps with rope handles attached. The three-way device had a T-shape with three handles, allowing simultaneous interactions for three dolphins. The four-way device had TT shape with four handles, allowing simultaneous interactions for four dolphins. The devices were filled with ice and fish and were designed to be opened by simultaneous pull of the row handles. For both devices, only one cap were removable during the trials, whereas the others were affixed and could not be opened. The research sessions were conducted during the free swimming time in between regular training sessions. Our findings with the T and the TT shaped devices were published in a research paper earlier this year. We are currently working on the study of the short-term impact of the use of the cognitive enrichment devices and we are focusing on the last two devices that I showed you on the video, the T-shape and the TT-shape devices. With each device, and that includes actually the two-way devices that I earlier showed as well, we recorded two minutes pre-session and two minutes post-session periods, meaning right before the device was given to the animals and right after the device was taken out of the pool. So at the time, the dolphins were provided with their regular enrichment devices. Thus, we were able to compare their behaviors um, right after the session. And if there is any impact of the use of the devices that should be seen in the post-session uh, period. This is the topic of one of our research students, uh, Rick Louis, whose pictures you can see on the right up corner. And uh, we haven't finished this uh, analysis at the moment, but the preliminary result shows that the duration of social behaviors post-session seem to be longer than pre-session. And the same thing was shown on the frequency of social behaviors. In conclusion, cognitive enrichment promote dolphin welfare under human care 
not only on short but on long term as well. As we can see right after the session, while it's only a preliminary data, it shows that the dolphins became more social, they cooperate more with each other, they play more with each other, and on a long term, all these behaviors show an increase over the 36 months of period of observation. And so we can conclude that these cognitive enrichments promote affiliative social behaviors in our dolphins. And moreover, which is really interesting, and I find this probably one of the most important thing to mention, is that over our six years of experiment, while we keep providing cognitive enrichment for our animals, the dolphins have a constant interest. We never had a session without any interactions. The dolphins always come and play with the device right after it's put in the pool, even after six years. So the, to summarize, we believe that cognitive enrichments are key for advancing both welfare and science simultaneously in cetaceans. And here are the references used in this presentation. Sure. We thank the animal care teams and our research volunteers and interns for their help and support with our studies and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Esther, for that very engaging presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing this next presentation, which is from Caroline Lee at CSIRO Australia, looking at a really hot topic at the moment, uh, the use of electric shocks on farm animals. Is it ethically acceptable? I would like to thank you for, for the opportunity to present this paper today. And I would like to acknowledge my co-author, Dr. Dana Campbell, who has contributed heavily to the research I will present today. So today I'm talking about the use of electric shocks on farm animals and whether or not it's ethically acceptable. Electric shocks are quite commonly used in farm management practices. So for example, um, these electric prods are used to stimulate movement of animals. Uh, we also use electric fences very commonly on farms. And there's new technologies such as virtual fencing that use an electric shock as well. Now I'm sure most of you would have experienced an electric shock at some stage of your lives. And you'd know that this is not a pleasant experience. Electric shocks are aversive, painful, and stress inducing. And their welfare impacts likely vary depending on the application and context of their use. Now, because of their aversive nature, the use of electric shocks does evoke animal welfare debate. And there's a lot of argument around whether or not they're ethically acceptable to use. So today I will talk about the use of electric shock on farm animals. And I'm going to use a case study of virtual fencing to highlight some of the key concepts around the ethical use of electric shock. So what is virtual fencing? Well, it's containment of animals without the use of a fixed fence. And this is done using signals to the animals that's provided via a neck band or collar. Um, there's a picture of one of the devices here and it uses an audio cue and an electric shock. Today, I'm going to cover some welfare assessment findings that have been been demonstrated um, around the use of virtual fencing. And the findings that I'll talk about today are mostly in relation to the eShepherd device itself. Um, this device is being commercialized by Gallagher. There are other systems being developed throughout the world, but the welfare assessment of these products is limited. And so I'll focus on the eShepherd device findings. So with virtual fencing, there are two stages of learning. Firstly, an animal will approach a boundary. It will receive an audio signal to warn that it's approached this invisible boundary. And at first they won't know what this means, and so they won't respond. But they will respond when it's paired with an electric shock, and they then hopefully stay within the fence boundary. The next stage is where the animals have learnt this association, and they respond to the audio alone, and hopefully stay within the boundary without receiving the electric shock. So this is called associative learning. 
So how long does it take for cattle to learn this association? So the measure we use for learning is how many interactions with the virtual fence are needed before the animal learns to respond to the audio cue by staying within the boundary and avoid receiving the electric shock. So on average, it takes cattle around 2.5 interactions with the virtual fence to learn to respond to the audio cue alone. Now it should be noted that there are there is a range um, in between animals. Um, so in this study, it was between one to six interactions with the fence, um, and that was with 64 animals. How about sheep? How long does it take for them to learn? Well, work done by Danilo Marini shows that sheep take on average three interactions to learn to respond to the audio cue alone. So they have a similar learning profile to cattle. So cattle and sheep seem to learn quite quickly to avoid the electric shock. However, we are using an aversive stimulus for virtual fencing. So what do we know about the welfare impacts of this? So to look at this, we developed a framework to assess the impact of virtual fencing on animal welfare. And this is based on predictability and controllability on the x-axis going from low to high and affect on the y-axis going from negative to positive. We propose that based on this theory, during the initial stages of learning, animals would initially sit in the bottom left quadrant as they don't yet know what the signals mean and they're, when they're first interacting with the fence, and they don't yet know how to avoid the electric shock. However, this would not be sustained in an, in an ongoing way and the situation would be transient as the animals have been shown to learn quite rapidly to respond to the audio cue and to avoid the electrical pulse. So once the animals learn, they would move to stage two learning, and this is in the top right quadrant, which is a position of high predictability and controllability and more positive effective state. <clears throat> so this framework is detailed um, in this perspective article, if anyone is interested in learning more about it. We then went further to then tease apart the different learning stages and determine welfare impacts during the initial learning period and in the more longer term deployment of virtual fencing. So in this paper, the stress response of livestock is proposed to differ in relation to the stage of the virtual fence learning. So in the first stage, the acute stress response occurs where the animals in that initial phase of learning, where it doesn't know what the audio cue means, it hasn't learned to associate that with the electric shock and it hasn't learned to avoid receiving the electric shock. So in this initial period, the relative aversiveness of the electrical pulse will determine the intensity and the duration of the acute stress response. So how aversive is the electric shock when applied to animals? This study looked at cattle and measured their acute stress response to electric shock. And there were three electric shocks given to cattle. The animals were handled in the same way and they um, had a control treatment and one that was restrained in a crush. So the control animals were handled in a similar way to the electric shock treatment. And what was found was that there was an acute stress response with um, this peaking with cortisol peaking after 15 minutes and then returning back to baseline by 180 minutes. The differences in the treatment were not evident and all three treatments elicited this acute stress response. So what about stage two, the more longer term um, learning has occurred and the animals are proposed to be able to predict and control their interaction with the fence. So this is after they've learned to respond to the audio cue. What are the welfare impacts on animals? So to look at this, um, there's a range of field-based measures that are appropriate. And one such study tested the hypothesis. Um, this was Talisa Keaton's study, and she looked at the influence of controllability on stress responses to virtual fencing stimuli in sheep. Now this is quite a complex study to explain in the short time I have available, but I'll just give you the key 
findings um, as they're really relevant to understanding the welfare impacts of virtual fencing. So what was found was that sheep that had learned to respond to the audio cue, so they could predict and control their interaction with the electric shock um, through avoiding the virtual boundary, did not have any differences in their cortisol response, body temperature and behavioural responses compared to a control treatment that did not receive any electric shocks. So what this demonstrated was that the sheep perceived the audio cue as benign once they had learnt to respond to it and avoid the shock. So this um, shows that the sheep were not stressed in this situation. So this is really important to understand and get insight into the experience of the animal. So what evidence do we have of welfare impacts of longer term deployment of virtual fencing? In this study, Campbell compared a virtual fence with a conventional electric fence and measured a range of welfare indicators. In terms of behaviour time budgets, there was no difference between the conventional electric fence and the virtual fence in beef cattle. In addition, there was no difference in fecal cortisol metabolites between the, the tape and the virtual fence treatment. So in all, she concluded that the behavioural and physiological measures of welfare showed minimal differences between electric tape fencing and virtual fencing. And a recent study is in agreement with these findings where they measured cortisol and manure from cattle that were virtually fenced using the no fence system. This was a Danish study where they deployed virtual fencing for 18 days on Angus cows and they didn't find any differences before and after virtual fence deployment. So while the science shows that the initial learning is stressful, the evidence gained to date indicates that once animals learn, the welfare impacts of virtual fencing are minimal. So science informs us about welfare impacts, but it's only one factor in deciding whether it is ethically acceptable to use electric shock. The values of a person, industry or organisation will guide ethical decision making around the use of electric shock. For example, the RSPCA is opposed to the use of virtual fencing due to the aversive nature of the electric shock and its potential to cause pain and distress. There is also a growing interest in looking at the welfare impacts to a form on policy development. For example, the UK government recently released a report looking at the application of virtual fencing to livestock. Perhaps one way to look at whether or not virtual fencing is ethically acceptable is the one suggested by Grummet and Butterworth in a recent paper. As well as determining the welfare impacts of the electric shock itself, they propose that unless the use of the electric shock has clear welfare benefits that cannot be practically delivered in another way, then it may not be ethically justified to use it on animals. So if we apply this to virtual fencing, some welfare benefits would come from improved monitoring via GPS location so farmers could see where their animals are and provide more timely treatment if they were sick or injured. Whether this could be achieved in other ways would depend on the farming context. Regular monitoring may be more achievable on smaller farms compared to larger extensive systems. Welfare benefits could also come from improved nutrition through better grazing management. You could potentially also move animals um, out of harm's way during bushfires and floods by using virtual fencing. And there'd be less fence injuries because of the risk associated with being caught and injured in fences. As well, there would be benefits to wildlife in that there was no internal fences, then there'd be less risk in getting caught in those. But do the welfare benefits outweigh the pain and stress of receiving electric shocks that we know are aversive and painful. So this is a challenge that is faced when considering the balance between benefits and costs. And this is a common problem in animal welfare science. Um, whenever we look at assurance programs or animal welfare assessment, it's always a real challenge to be able to weigh up 
the benefits and the costs. So time for conclusions. Well, the science shows us that the welfare impacts of virtual fencing are short term and the longer term impacts appear to be minimal. There are, however, some knowledge gaps that do need to be addressed around longer term deployment of six months or more, and also understanding individual differences in animal learning. As well, it would be really important for any new virtual fencing system that is developed to undergo independent animal welfare assessment. So in terms of determining whether or not using electric shock is ethically acceptable on animals, there is some approaches that can be used. So developing a, a weighing up option between costs and benefits to animal welfare is one such approach. However, really importantly, it's really comes down to an individual's or an organization's values that will determine whether or not the use of electric shock is considered to be acceptable for deployment for farm management purposes. And finally, I would just like to acknowledge the amazing team who have been involved in this body of work that I presented today, um, the CSIRO Animal Behaviour and Welfare Team and our research collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. That was a great presentation to really get us thinking about what's acceptable for animals in different circumstances as well. Is what we consider acceptable for animals in farming context the same as what we would consider for perhaps animals that are our companions? So um, without further ado, I'll move on to introducing our third and final speaker for this session. So uh, we're going to be looking at the great topic of training as enrichment, a critical review from Eduardo Fernandez from the University of Adelaide. I'll see you after this presentation with the speakers for questions. Thank you. Okay, hey, hi. So we're gonna talk about training as enrichment. My name is Eduardo, as, uh, Eduardo Fernandez. I'm here at the University of Adelaide and I'm gonna jump right into our presentation here. So the first question really, and this is, I'll talk a little bit about when we're talking about training as enrichment is, can training be enriching? Be a pretty short presentation if the simple answer was not yes. However, there's a big caveat here. We cannot assume training is enriching. So the foundation for this presentation comes from a, a, a review that I published earlier this year. And in that review, and I'm more than happy, it's by the same title, uh, more than happy to get that to anyone. There's handouts that should be available as well for this presentation to make it a little easier to follow along since I'll be going a bit fast. But I'm going to talk about three hypotheses here that I talk about in the paper that will detail how training can be tested, can be empirically demonstrated to be enriching. So these are the three hypotheses. I'll get into them more specifically later on. So training facilitating enrichment usage, training can modify interactions, and training expands behavioral repertoires. But again, I'll detail those more later on. Before that, uh, to start off with, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the history of training and enriching, enrichment itself, environmental enrichment. And before that, I'm gonna give some basic operational definitions. So to start off with, what are those operational definitions? Well, we have two very important components we have to define here, which is animal training and environmental enrichment. So for the most part, what I'm talking about here with training has to do with respondent operant conditioning, particularly operant conditioning procedures, reinforcement or reward-based methods. I'll talk about that a lot more. And we're gonna really focus on those reinforcement-based procedures and then in terms of this operational definition for enrichment, this comes from a few places, including my article and places where I've defined this before. What you can see here is that I'm really defining enrichment in terms of an interaction, not just some stimulus. So it's not just some stimulus or event. It is the interaction between those. So it's how the animal responds to that event, that interaction between their behavior 
and that stimulus or event. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the history of modern animal training. And I detail a little bit of this in the Fernandez 2022 publication that I mentioned, the, the Training as Enrichment, a Critical Review, same title as this paper. I, we, uh, Dr. Allison Martin and I detail it a lot more, some of this history of both, both modern animal training and environmental enrichment in this paper. We published all of these references. They're listed in that review paper, and I'm happy to get you any of those papers as well. There'll be links to my ResearchGate profile that has a lot of these publications there. So much of what we think of as modern animal training really stems from two events. Both of these, by the way, Skinner's discovery of shaping. The first place that he used this term was in his 1951 paper, How to Teach Animals. And then in that same year, the uh, Keller and Marion Breland published an article about a new field of applied animal psychology, which talks a, a lot about this practice of using uh, operant conditioning procedures to train animals. Both of these events are tied back to Project Pelican or Project Pigeon, which was, uh, there's a couple pictures here on the left that show you some of these events. It was Skinner's attempt to train pigeons to guide bombs during World War II. He developed this in the early 1940s. Uh, on the bottom left picture there is Skinner and Keller Breland on top of the General Mills building in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I won't cover too much of this. It's a really interesting history that's detailed in this Fernandez and Martin article some more. So if you're really interested in how would pigeons guide bombs, go to that article. So the point being is that because of these events, the Breelands ended up leaving academia. They started animal behavior enterprises. They eventually moved from Minneapolis to Arkansas to start this animal behavior enterprises organization, so Abe. They created IQ Zoo, which was a, a roadside attraction uh, where tourists could learn about behavior analysis and see lots of fun events like, uh, I believe, I, I always forget this bunny's name, but I think they called him Professor Bundles or something like that, um, who, who would play a piano on command. So there were a bunch of, of really common uh, uh, basic training uh, events that they would show people what they were able to do using reinforcement. By 1955, they started training dolphins and other marine mammals for dolphin shows. So. A lot of this is covered in other articles, including that Fernandez and Martin article. So uh, the main point here is that because of the Breelands, because of this work they did, they produced that transparent rewards-focused set of training procedures, which really led the way to the, the modern advent of training. The fact that they were very transparent about it and they focused on reinforcement were two very important events. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of enrichment, also detailed in Fernandez and Martin, 2021. This really started with Hal Markowitz, who was working with the Portland Metro Park Zoo, uh, what's now the Oregon Zoo in Portland, Oregon. And he also worked with San Francisco Zoo and the Honolulu Zoo in Hawaii. So he did what he called behavioral engineering, which eventually led to this term he called behavioral enrichment, which eventually turned into environmental enrichment. Now, what he was doing was things like what you see on the left. This was with Honolulu Zoo, where he was training an Asian elephant. Uh, they, he would have this chain the Asian elephant could pull. That would result in the elephant having some food tossed into its exhibit. So in other words, there were some. these were basic operant conditioning procedures, what he was calling behavioral engineering. So Markowitz saw animals in an environment these antecedent stimuli that he wanted, and he wanted them doing these specific responses, these behaviors, and he rewarded those actions. So he reinforced those responses, the consequences, or in other words, what we call the three-term contingency here, or the ABCs of operant conditioning. So antecedent behavior consequence. This is how Markowitz set all these things up. So another couple examples. He had polar bears that would pace all day. This is at the, the Portland Metro Park Zoo. 
Mark, how Markowitz and his colleagues created a voice-activated mechanical device, a microphone, built into the polar bear exhibit. When the polar bears would go over and do their polar bear roaring into this microphone, it was attached to a conveyor belt with fish that would activate the fish, and they would have a fish catapulted into the pool of their exhibit, like the bottom right picture. That's a colorized picture uh, that I colorized for the purposes of this publication. Another example is up in the top right there with uh, the San Francisco Zoo. So that's a serval that would chase some artificial prey. If it chased the artificial prey along that, that tube, then it would end up getting a food reward. Okay, so that said, let's jump into these, these three different hypotheses about how training can be enriching. And the first of those is the simplest, which is that training facilitates enrichment usage. It's certainly the most direct way that we could demonstrate that training equals enrichment. It simply means train the animal to interact with an enrichment device. If they interact with the enrichment device, then that training should be enriching. The surprising part of this is that there are very few studies. Really, most, almost all of the studies are the old, older Markowitz studies that he published, where he would train these animals to use some type of device. Otherwise, most modern enrichment does not involve training, except here's one example. It's a paper I published a few years ago where we trained penguins to interact with enrichment items for lasting effects. I won't go into too much more detail about this. Again, if, if you're interested, please read uh, the review paper or this study itself, which is Fernandez, Kinley, and Timberlake, 2019. Uh, Lily Chin also has a lovely blog where she detailed. So if you if you search on Lily's site for penguins, you'll end up finding her blog where she details the, the training that we did and what this looked like. So otherwise, there have been some people talking about using computer devices so modern or other forms of modern technology to train animals to interact with enrichment. So these are a couple of those studies, Carter et al., uh, as well as uh, John Coe and Julia Hoy have talked about this as well. There's also some indirect evidence from a couple different phenomenon uh, or phenomena, uh, which contra freeloading, contra freeloading being animals choosing to work to get food over freely accessible food in some way. So, for instance, Sassonianor and Powell showed that some giraffes would choose to get uh, browse out of these in hanging enrichment devices rather than just go and eat browse that was not in a device. So they would contra free look. Well, that's that's one example, indirect evidence at least. There's also some evidence from preference assessments. In this case, some wolves. Uh, in this Dory et al. article, uh, the wolves chose training activities over enrichment items. So, suggests that they might find the training itself enriching. Okay, in terms of the second hypothesis, the training can modify interactions. We're talking about interactions with other animals or people. So, certainly we know training itself, animal training, can, it will increase interactions with us. That's not simply what we're talking about. We're talking about whether that interaction itself is enriching outside of just those times when they're being trained. There is certainly some evidence from the primate literature. Uh, I, I'm going to massacre her name, but Spiezio uh, has done some studies with primates showing that training the primates, doing some simple training procedures, well, can, she can change some of the ways they interact with the other primates. There's also certainly evidence that using aversive training procedures, things like shock collars with dogs, is not enriching. So there's some publications out of uh, Daniel Mills' camp, uh, as well as just some general publications on this concept. Lots of stuff out there. I won't go into too much other detail here for the sake of time. Otherwise, there's certainly some indirect evidence from human-animal interactions research particularly animal visitor interaction research done in zoos. So this is stuff that Sally Sherwin, Paul Hemsworth, and myself have talked about a bit. So one example is this long-billed corella, uh, uh, Claude, that would seek out visitor interactions. That suggests that some of these interactions itself 
might be enriching. And so therefore there might be, again, some indirect evidence that interacting with people and therefore training would be enriching. There's certainly more direct evidence uh, from things. One example here uh, from, this was a paper I published last year where we trained elephants to interact with a public feeding event at Woodland Park Zoo. So the keepers there train the elephants to engage in these public feeding events. And the result of the public feeding event was increased foraging overall by the elephants, decreased in activity, and decreased stereotypy, uh, stereotypic activity. So it certainly suggests a potential enriching effect. Okay. The final of these hypotheses is very broad, simply that training itself expands behavioral repertoires. In other words, does learning itself equal an increased enriched experience? That's at least tentative to saying that learning itself equals enriching. Certainly, uh, Vicki Melfi, who first talked about this idea of training enrich as, as enrichment, proposed three ways to would work for the sake of time. I'm not going to cover each one of those areas, uh, but they're what I combined to capture this entire concept of that training expands behavioral repertoires. So there's some indirect shelter evidence. Dogs that get adopted uh, post train, they're, they're more likely to be adopted if they've had some type of training experience at the shelter. That suggests that somehow the shelter uh, the training in the shelter made them more likely to be adoptable. So it expanded their repertoire in some way that made them more appealing. Uh, a follow-up to this is Grant and Warrior's study where they did the same thing except with cats in a shelter. And they showed that the cats, they looked more specifically at the behaviors that did change because of the training, showed that the, the cats spent more time exploring. Uh, they actually, act, the cats actually spent more time looking for people as well. So looking for the people that were going to train them. And then uh, Shin and Block showed with African wild dogs that training reduced some undesired behaviors like stereotypies. And finally, there are a few papers out there now, DeFore being one of those, that shows that dolphins trained for show purposes will actually seek out trainers outside of shows. So that suggests that the training itself expands behavioral repertoires and is itself somehow enriching. Okay. So to finish up, to summarize, I've essentially run out of time here. So I'm just gonna put this up here. Training, we can't simply assume it's enriching. There's empirical evidence, but not a lot. We need certainly more. We need lots more research using things like newer welfare-based measures, behavioral diversity, enclosure use variability. We need to look at uh, learning over time, which means using within subject or single case designs. and Ultimately, I want to emphasize this point that our training itself improve if if we expect it to improve the lives of animals, we need to show or want to say that we need to show that effect. Reward-based dog training is an ideal study variable to examine this effect. Ultimately, more science makes for better application. So with that, thank you. Here's some ways to connect with me. Please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and uh, friend me, find me on Instagram, Twitter. Here's my lab here, and as well as my research gate. Thank you, and I look forward to your, to your questions. Fantastic. I'd like to enjoy, uh, enjoy, invite even the speakers from this session to turn on their microphones and their videos and join me now for the question and answer session. Welcome. It's great to see everyone. Excellent. I'd, I'd like to actually start before I get into all the questions from our wonderful attendees. I, I want to ask each of you something just I guess on that line of controversy. How much of these interactions, so whether we're looking at dolphins interacting with toys or we're looking at livestock interacting with the fences or training as enrichment, how much of how successful these programs are is determined by the perceptions of people. And that might be in the general community. It may be within the workforce that are in, you know, directly involved with these animals. Um, how much of their success or their 
their lack of success rely on how people perceive it, do you think? Esther, would you like to go first? Sure. So I feel like for us, the general perception is not really important. For mm -hmm. us, I've built up these kind of very generalized but also specific forms that allow us to survey the um, the success of the various research equipment or, um, or um, enrichment devices. So my study is specifically focused on that. And um, our devices were used during the time when the animals were not even on display, perhaps, and they kept using the devices, but sometimes when they are on display. So I think in terms of success, from the dolphin's perspective, it's what's important for us to see what's their behavior response and whether they show interest. And then in terms of towards the public, that's another question. So we can always investigate how the public can uh, perceive what kind of um, messages we can deliver. And I think they are both equally important, um, but they can be measured in a different way. Hmm. Caroline, with the, the fences, I know that obviously there's a, a convenience for farmers to be able to shift fence lines just by clicking on a laptop or their phone, not needing to physically move wire and posts. Um, but the potential, I guess, knockback or um, from public perception, how does that play into the success of these these kind of interactions? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I'm not sure if there's been any actual research looking at whether or not it would be acceptable from a community perspective. However, um, and, and I suppose one of the, the things we don't have yet is a real commercial product that's out there being used um, by a lot of different farmers. So I think that's going to be an interesting journey which will happen over the next few years because there's several companies that are commercialising virtual fencing systems at the moment and it will be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, having said that, like well, there's, a, there's a lot of different things happening at the moment around um, legislation changes um, both in Australia and internationally and that's why there's a lot of investigation into the welfare impacts of virtual fencing. Um, however, I think if you, know, if you think of it as something that's similar to a conventional electric fence, it's just that the um, audio cue replaces a visual cue, then um, it's probably fairly similar in terms of um, using electric shocks to contain animals. So I suppose it's really around the, the story as well that's um, conveyed to the public. And Eduardo, what do you, you think on this, this sort of area of how we perceive things yeah, there's, um, sorry, I'm, I'm still, uh, as, as we've talked about before, I'm under the weather, I'm sick right now, so I'm sorry if my voice is a little crackly. Um, there, there's a couple of interesting perspectives as far as I'm concerned, and one of those actually is in, interestingly related to um, some of this invisible versus electric fencing. I think there's an interesting point to be made there, uh, but I'll come back to that, because the first point I would say is um, in terms of perception, I think one of the biggest problems we have, and this is very much the case for training as enrichment, is that a lot of this is based on opinion, it's based on anecdote, and that's it's the absence of quantitative data that ends up being one of the biggest problems. So this assumption that people often make that, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, my, my dog loves training sessions, he loves interacting with me, so um, of course this is enriching, this is positive for the welfare of the animal. So that's that's a bit, that, that's a, a difficult leap. And what we need to do is, um, I, what I like to say about welfare in general is that it is a, it's a subjective field filled with objective measures. So much of what guides how, what we decide to study is based on our opinions. So, we, we need better measures, is what I would say, even for what we're calling enrichment. Um, the fact that we still keep referring to enrichment as a thing rather than an interaction, I think, is a bit of a, bit of a problem. So yeah. the, the other point that I, I, I'll just make this final little point um, is that what I was going to say is some of that also has to do with what we're comparing, what we're studying. So um, 
Uh, Caroline, I was going to mention one of the things that I, I've seen come up, and um, I've I've talked a little bit with people like Vanilla about this um, since she's here at Adelaide about um, at least I've brought this up to her uh, before about uh, the comparisons of invisible to electric fencing is interesting, but what about the effects of just using electric fencing in general on sheep? So what is that? Because to say, I, I, I'm never surprised that an animal can figure out the difference between an audio sound and an actual visual discriminative stimulus. But that's not the real welfare um, issue as far as I see it. It's what effect does the electric fencing in general have on the animal? And I think that, that there's, a, there's clearly a very heated debate that could be had about this. My uh, attitude towards it is it's an empirical question. We need data. So uh, I'd like to see more data and issues like uh, looking at that because we don't know what the welfare, I mean, we know that there are welfare concerns. And as you already mentioned, Caroline, there's, there's uh, uh, getting rid of the legality of, of shot collars for dogs for uh, training purposes in different places in Australia and different places in the world. So how does that compare? What's the difference? These are all really important empirical questions that I'd like to see more done to investigate that. Um, a question that came through from our attendees for Esther um, relates to the relocation that you mentioned and whether you think that had an effect on the behavioural trends that you identified. Thank you for the question. Um, I believe no, because we do transfer our animals between the two facilities quite regularly. So we have um, yearly or bi-yearly um, renovation when the animals are actually trained that we practice the relocation steps on a regular basis, even if we don't need to relocate the animals. So they were very familiar with those, those facilities. So that's why I'm quite confident that the relocation itself didn't have any effect on the animals. And Caroline, we, we've also been asked whether it's possible to use non-aversive cues, such as just audio alone or some kind of haptic vibration through the collar to replace the electric shock in the training process. Um, have you got a response to that? Yeah, um, there has been some recent work done to look at using audio only and different ranges of audio cues to virtually fence sheep. Um, and what they found was that it did stop them from going to a food bowl. However, that was sort of a short term, you know, steering away from something. Um, and, and the audios would li likely be novel at that time. Um, however, I think over time, if there was no further consequence to the sheep, they'd probably learn that it wasn't really that meaningful to it. Um, and they'd probably learn to ignore it or habituate to the audio over time, especially if there is a really motivating area with green grass that they want to get access to. So. Um, while it's a nice idea to use non-aversive only, um, I think there does need to be some sort of um, consequence to um, associate the audio cue with for them to be prevented from accessing something they're highly motivated to access. Um, on that, there was also, could we kind of flip it, rather than using an aversive stimuli to discourage them entering an area, could you do something that's more rewarding to encourage them to stay where you want them to be? Has that been considered or tried? Yeah, that, that's we did. Th we've thrown that around a bit. Um, once again, like if it's normally you want them to stay in an area that's probably to protect another area that might be more attractive to them. So, um, you know, over time they would probably move into that area that's more attractive um, because it's hard to continually provide something that's positive. Um, we all know that positive states aren't ongoing, you know, you kind of have a new baseline if you're in this positive state. So, um, you know, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's challenging um, from an animal kind of learning and motivation perspective. And then um, in the interest of time, this will be our finest, our finest, finest, maybe final question. Um, for both Esther and also Eduardo, just quickly, would you, um, the questions come up from a couple of different people sort of asking within confined animal situations where they're under our management um are they engaging with training activities just because they're bored like what do we really know about boredom in confined animals 
Esther, would you like to respond to that first? Sure. Well, obviously, I wouldn't be able to answer this question uh, unless I can talk to the animals and ask them personally what they think. Um, but what I can tell you from my study point of view that we do continuously provide them with all sorts of enrichments, uh, which are not only uh, items, but also interactions, as Eduardo mentioned. Um, we are continuously there and try to provide the best care as we can. Um, from the cognitive enrichment point of view, I can say that every time I put, like, we don't train the animals how to interact with these enrichments at all, because I was specifically interested in whether they can figure it out by themselves without us telling them how to do that. And since we put the first enrichment in the water, that was 2016, um, until today, when I have another session today actually coming up, whenever we drop the uh, equipment in the water, they interact with it. And then they interact with it in a continuous way, which I think if it was just against boredom, that would be a little bit different from um, the kind of enthusiasm that they express towards our enrichment. And um, this is not really a right measurement, but when we place other enrichment items in the water, you can see that um, lengths of the interaction might not be even comparable to the ones that uh, we designed for cognitive enrichment. So that's why we think it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, but of course, we need to continue the work and see what we can learn about our animals and design more and more devices and hope that that makes our animals' life happier. Eduardo, in your experience? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short since I had enough to say already and, and my voice is kind of on, on its last leg here. Um, Boredom is an interesting concept because it's 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 a circular construct at some level, right? So um, how do you know an animal's bored because of what it's doing or what it's not doing? Why is it doing or not doing that thing because it's bored? It's not clear what that means. What I like to say about constructs like that when we look at boredom is what you're actually asking is the context under which something does or doesn't occur. And so it's really about the comparison that we're trying to make. Um, so if we're saying, well, this animal is more bored in this environment compared to some other environment, we're saying it's not receiving something or it's not, this environment doesn't provide the support that it normally would. It's just about what the animal is experiencing potentially as it is the environment and what that is inducing. Um, so that's an interesting question because that's something that we come up with myself as a zoo researcher um, primarily a zoo researcher, I do quite a bit of companion animal work too. Um, the, you can see how that comes up. It's what, how is this animal living in this environment compared to how it would live outside of that environment? And I think that that's, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a terrifying question at some level for myself as a welfare researcher, um, because I want to make sure I have uh, uh, some exhibit that provides the proper support but if I'm only looking at that exhibit, it's difficult to make that assessment. So I understand that I get that context of the question. I just wanna uh, point out that it's a little difficult to frame it in terms of boredom. And what I would say, as I say so much of the time, is that it's a really interesting empirical question and I think we'll get better answers um, going forward. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you, that, that's really good. I wanna thank you all again for your fantastic contributions to our program and for being with us today to answer the questions live. Um, hopefully we'll see you back for the next session. We're gonna take a short break now. We'll be back in just over 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.